Hi, welcome to Naval Gazing on valleyindy.org and 103.5 WNHH, New Haven's community radio station. Today's episode is brought to you by Valley Gives Back, a new initiative of the Valley Community Foundation. Adding a charity to your estate plan creates a legacy that tells future generations what causes matter to you during your life. Your action inspires others to follow your lead and to make a difference. With a planned gift, you have the power to impact your community forever without affecting your current lifestyle. For more information, visit valleygivesback.org. The Valley Gives Back is an initiative of the Valley Community Foundation, connecting private philanthropy to the long-term public good of the Valley. Plan now, give later, impact tomorrow. Valleygivesback.org. Hundreds of years we brought you the news Rid of the info we gave you the clues Owners' profits were always sky high Change in market now threatens our lives Post literation, critical reading, dumb down nation signs have been breeding TV sucking ideas from our head public discourse just about dead will ride the dinosaur yeah ride the dinosaur hey everybody welcome to navel gazing on valleyindy.org and 103.5 fm on wnhh new haven's community radio station today we're going to be talking about online comments journalism the internet all kinds of good stuff our guest is Marie K. Shanahan. She's an assistant professor of journalism at the University of Connecticut. She just published a book called Journalism, Online Comments, and the Future of Public Discourse. Marie was also a reporter at the Hartford Current. Uh, she was also an online editor at the Hartford Current, and she serves on the board of directors of the nonprofit Connecticut Health Investigative Team, Connecticut Foundation for Open Government, and the Connecticut News Project, that last one being the uh, group that publishes CT Mirror. So without further ado, here's Marie Shanahan. I want to welcome on to Valley Naval Gazing, Marie K. Shanahan, an assistant professor of journalism at the University of Connecticut. Marie recently published a book called Journalism, Online Comments, and the Future of Public Discourse. Marie, thank you so much for coming on. You're welcome, Eugene. It's nice to talk to you. Yeah, Marie and I used to work together on the web staff at the Hartford Current about 100 years ago. I was there for about 10 minutes. (laughs) Yes. But I remember part of it. I remember that I would work the night shift. And I took mm-hmm. it upon myself on occasion to go in and moderate comments on the Hartford Current website, which at the time, <laughs> I think it was like, maybe it was a topics discussion board? It was. Just, I think it was, it was topics. It's when it was really bad. Mm-hmm. Is topics even around anymore? It actually still is. When I was doing the research for this book, my first anecdote is an experience that happened at the Hartford Current. And I looked up to see if I could find any of those comments from that incident, and they're all still online. You were at The Current for, what, uh, 10 years or so? Talk a little bit about yeah. your, your background there as a reporter, journalist, okay, well, I was Yeah, I worked um, as an online producer and online editor at The Current for 12 years. And before that, I was a print reporter for the beginning of my career for five years. Um, and so when this incident happened in 2008, I was actually in grad school at Quinnipiac University getting my master's degree in interactive communications. And the whole idea about how people were talking to each other online, it really in, in concerned uh, with the, you know, with free speech, but also how it was affecting people's reputations, who was responsible for it, was the newspaper responsible for what we were hosting, um, and you could just see, I could just see like it, it just looked like a big mess, and it was really changing the way people were talking to each other because there was anonymous online comments, people were defaming each other, but then nobody was responsible. And so what if you were on the receiving end of, of one of those attacks online? What, what could you do? What was, what was sort of the result of that? And um, 
if you worked at a news organization, you suddenly, you know, you had to deal with this new thing that was just causing more problems because we had all these other things we had to worry about at the same time with the newspaper industry sort of like going downhill a little bit. People were getting laid off. People weren't re buying the newspaper as much. But now we had this giant conversation that was happening online that was blowing up. That was just seemed to be getting bigger, and we just really just didn't know what to do with it. And it's um, interesting because I think uh, in, in that time period, when, if we go back to 2005, 2006, 2007, 2008, mm -hmm. sort of the early days of, uh, of digital journalism, or at least when newspapers started to adapt to the internet, right. it, many times you'd have these reporters who had, you know, established reporters, good reporters, worked uh, their whole adult life in newspapers. And then their sort of first introduction to the digital era a lot of times was these trolls online. <laughs> it's just turned, right. a lot of times the newsroom, I mean, if you even look at like the way the current was divided, you had the newsroom and web staff. And a lot of times right. that still exists today where the reporters aren't necessarily in there moderating, uh, you know, the, the newspaper's Facebook page. But, That's uh, right. And even, you know, it's funny because even back then, the reporters were kind of discouraged. Reporters occasionally would come over and say, can I do something about the comments on my story? And the editors, I wasn't the editor at the time, but the editors would say, no, like we didn't want any of the reporters to go in there because they felt like they wouldn't allow a conversation to happen, that they would be so defensive they would just delete all the comments and shut everything down. But at the same time, maybe there that was reasonable because maybe the conversation wasn't worth having um or it wasn't a conversation it was just you know personal attacks um yeah. either on the journalists themselves or on the subjects of the news stories which we've seen sort of over and over again and I mean, you know, you. I remember you were at the Danbury paper, too, and you used to have to deal with comments there. It was, yeah. Uh, I, I think if you do a follow-up, you should uh, uh, do do a, a, a look at, like, the mental toll it takes on the people who have to moderate these comments. I will volunteer. Yeah. Just this weekend, you know, uh, we're putting together a debate. I guess by the time this podcast uh, airs, the debate um, will be over. Hopefully it went well. But, uh, you know, it, it, we're a two-person staff, and so the, the, just the logistics of trying to organize to get 200 people to show up to a debate are well beyond what we're capable of doing. But, you know, we're doing it. We're, mm -hmm. uh, you know, marketing it online and using Twitter and using Facebook. And, we, I'm, I'm, you know, I changed our, our avatar on Twitter and Facebook to promote the. I'm doing everything I can. Every, every little digital <laughs> trick I've picked up over the years, I'm trying to get people to, to go to this debate and create a Facebook uh, event for it. I take out an ad to promote that event. First comment on the discussion is, uh, the reporters ask questions and kids ask questions, but no actual voters ask questions. And <laughs> ruined my weekend. Just that one comment just ruined <laughs> my weekend. I'm like, why am I even... Because, uh, I mean, obviously, that, that's not the type of... We just chose not to have that format. It's not a town hall uh, format. Right. And you can always so, invite people before it happens if they want to submit their questions. Which, which was right in the, it you, was right in the discussion. It was them. like paragraph number three. If you have a question, here's right. an email. And, and of course, it, but that's, I guess, you know, as, as comments have evolved, I think we've sort of, right, we, we're out of the sewer that we were in a few years back for the most part or no? I don't think that we're out of the sewer. I mean, I, I you know, one of the analogies that I use in the book is that, it, is that it's Lord of the Flies. <laughs> Okay, we're all kind of like stuck in middle school. We have this new technology, we haven't matured with it, and it's just dog eat dog. You know, we're just taking each other down to like figure out who's, nobody's really listening. And part of it is the, is the venue. So, you know, you're talking through a screen, you're not looking in anybody's eyes, you can't hear the sound of their voice. You can't, there's, it's asynchronous, so you're not responding immediately like you and I are right now. So, you, all of those things, there's like a breakdown. So you could tell the guy probably didn't read your post before he responded. <laughs> yeah, it was just so immediate. So he wasn't listening. Yeah. Right. So he wasn't listening. And so how do you how do you force that other than you really can't? So the the venue itself is kind of flawed and unless we come up with, you know, and maybe we will, you know, newer technology, different systems in terms of the their design to help people to listen better. And then if they're listening, will they will they respond in a more meaningful way? Um, because Everyone's just sort of shouting, and no one's listening. Um, and you know, there's one quote that I use in the book where they talk about, where one guy says that it's, you know, right now it's everyone wants to filibuster everybody else. 
Yeah, um, and, every, and another. I, I read at one point you wrote, uh, quoting someone else, uh, everybody wants to just prove they're smarter than everyone else, too. That yeah. seems to be a component. Right, which again limits the listening. And if, like, if you're going, I, I mean, I'm impressed with you guys that you're holding a debate, like you're holding an in-person debate. Because I wish that more conversations that happened below news stories were was that kind of back and forth. That it was a debate where maybe you go in, you post a question, and then people respond to that question in a thoughtful way, read what the other people say, and and respond. Because that's what you do in an actual debate. Um, but it's hard to do that in in this space. Um, because of it's just one big, you know, think about on Facebook, it's just one big line. So you're not seeing stuff side by side, you're just seeing it, you know, from the top to the bottom. And there's not, there's not a great sorting system, you can jump in there and you can pin stuff, but it doesn't, it doesn't lend itself to that sort of listening and back and forth. And I'm amazed, um, I mean, we're, we're sort of lucky at the Valley Indy because we're small. I mean, that's a huge advantage when it comes to moderating online comments and trying to keep the discourse uh, civil. Uh, right, we or have, at least on, on topic. Right, yeah. And that's, well, yeah, that's a whole other thing I've started to, I've done this conversion where I would, all right, if somebody wants to be off, to, now I just delete it. I'm like, no, because we're just going to go down a whole other road. It changes the whole uh, uh, subject of the conversation if you allow the first comment to be about whatever. Uh, right. That's a whole other thing. But I can't even imagine. I mean, I don't know how I like our Facebook page as it is. You know, 14,000 followers is about manageable for us. When I see, you know, newspapers that are larger to us, larger than us or cover the entire state. I don't know how, how is anybody is anybody doing it right out there now? Uh, and at, at any I mean, of these levels? Terms- in, in terms of the, the Facebook comments that I see, or not even Facebook comments, just comments like on site, like the Harvard Currents comments, which I still look at every once in a while, it's, they're not useful. They're, they're, there's nothing, there's, you know, it's very rare that there's going to be something good in there worth highlighting. And they actually changed to a system now where people can kind of like pay to get their comment pinned to the top. Oh, wow. Which it could be definitely taken advantage of by people who who have a particular point of view they have enough money or they want to they have enough time to spend on this and they they pin that thing to the top so then it does change the nature of the how people understand the story and that's one thing that i found in the research for my book is that yeah. a lot of times the first comment the first couple comments that appear under the story so let's say you know you read the story maybe you skimmed it maybe you you know you, you read the beginning and then jumped down to the end whatever it is that you think you understood when, once you get to that comment, maybe it's the first one, maybe it's the second one, when it starts to go off track, it changes the way you feel about the story and maybe the way you understand it. And so that's why a lot of news organizations, I think, have eliminated comments. They don't want to have the comment directly on the bottom of the news story anymore. They prefer to have it, like where you do, on Facebook. So, you know, can you tell on Facebook if people actually even clicked on the story before they started commenting? Or did they just take the little blurb that you yeah. wrote Clearly. The headline and then the that's, little blurb that appears underneath the link. Yeah, that that's read. read before posting. is uh, we, we do that a lot. We try not to sound like jerks, but that is definitely, you can tell that's a huge problem where people are just reacting uh, to whatever they see right uh, in front of them. Whatever fits on their phone, they're not really clicking the link. But that was a fascinating part of the book that you published uh, recently. That you had cited a 2012 study showed that people who read an article without comments found the article to be impartial, meaning it wasn't leaning one way uh, or the other uh, in terms of the reporter or editor's personal feelings. But when user comments that clashed with their own personal opinions were appended to the story, suddenly the suspicion of media bias came about, a right. phenomenon known as the hostile media effect. And that was, that was eye-opening to me. I didn't even know that was a thing. Yeah. Um, and so, I mean, that's, that's something that that journalists have, news organizations are, have to, you know, it's there. It doesn't mean it happens every single time. It doesn't mean it happens to every single audience member, but it's present. And, you know, the polarization that we have right now, especially around anything political, and I've seen it on your, some of your Facebook posts too, where you'll, you know, you'll write a story about something. Someone who's not part of the community will suddenly find your story and decide that they're going to leave a comment. And that, that comment tends to be more hostile because they actually aren't a member of the community. Um, and that was another study that, that I saw where it was interlopers were more rude than people who are regular commenters. Yeah, and, you know, I mentioned that uh, Facebook event 
about my debate we have coming up or what have, which will have happened. I had I had purchased an ad, so I have a feeling that comment was probably just someone who Facebook decided through their algorithm to expose it to this person. He wasn't didn't probably had no idea what we are because uh, I found a way to combat negativity or, or at least keep the discussion relatively civil because some, sometimes people will, will say whatever with their real first name uh, last first mm-hmm. and last name attached but if you're we've always made it a point to hey we're people we're here on the valley Indy. although it says valley you know, i'm eugene i live on hawthorne avenue you know here's a picture right. of my kids <laughs> that seems to if people know they're dealing with a human at least, uh, I mean, I think it's just good, uh, you know, as reporters to do that. But it also seems to keep the conversation uh, somewhat civil, except in those cases where, I mean, there's certain topics that I'm just shying away from posting about now, unless it happens mm. uh, locally. But, I mean, I'm not going to write really about uh, 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 guns that much. There's other outlets that, that can do that. Uh, pit bulls. Whenever a pit, if a pit bull gets shot, or you use the term pit bull, there's this influx of people from all over the net who just they just come in and they're ready for a fight. Uh, yeah. So again, I don't know how the but let's talk about your the the research that went in to making this book a reality. So that's where you were a mine hunter. You were out there scouring the internet, reading internet comments for what for how long? How how did this come together? Well, I mean, I got, I got this job at UConn six years ago, and I really started researching for this book about probably about three years ago. So I went through our re- most recent presidential election cycle, reading a what lot a, of comments. What a way! What what a thing to start on there, huh? Yeah, um, and so it obviously the the topic I think is really timely um, because you know you think about our discourse, you know, in our, in our democracy, it is shifting from in-person to, to digital. Like mm. more people are more likely to participate in a conversation because they can do it online, whether it's on Facebook. You know, more people are talking than ever, um, which can be good. But it's also you have all these other things that are talking at the same time. So you have propagandists that are talking. You have these bots that are talking. I mean, there's all, been all this new research that has come out you know, where the Congress is asking questions of, of Twitter and Facebook about how their systems were manipulated, where there's trolls going on and just trying to, you know, steer conversations so people get more upset. Um, And so we have, like, as journalists, we have all these things that we have to deal with in terms of if if the news starts conversations, which it always has, you know, back in the old days, you read the newspaper and then you're standing next to the water cooler and you have a conversation about what you just read, right? Mm. So... That still happens. We want that to happen as journalists. We want people to read our stuff, you know, think about it, and have a conversation. That means that we actually got through to somebody, right? But at the same time, you know, we're starting these conversations, but we have no control over they ha- how they happen. They're happening in these places that we have no control over. We don't know what people are saying. And then the idea of our story that, you know, if you're a good journalist, you're, you're basing it on the truth, that it gets twisted, it gets twisted around. And now we're being also attacked you know, that, uh, for media bias, um, you know, regularly from the, the you know, the top, <laughs> the top guy in the country um, is, always, is constantly attacking journalists for fake news. So I don't, you know, what do you do with those conversations? Like, can we continue them? Do people benefit from them? Do news organizations benefit from having those conversations? Because this is our way forward. Like, there's no going back, mm. right? People are going to continue to talk online from here on out. Unless the power goes out. You're depressing me, Marie. This is... Yeah. But I think that there's hope. That's the thing. And, Eugene, when you talked about your news site being smaller and that it's, you can, like, you have more control over it, not so much control, but you have more of a handle on it, like you can moderate it better because the community is smaller. Um, You know, you look at a a website like the New York Times, and they hire all kinds of moderators. They're mm-hmm. working with Google and, you know, artificial intelligence and all these algorithms to try and help them deal with, deal with comments. They make everyone register. They know who they are. Um, and not every, not every comment is included on every story. Um, for a long time, the New York Times only allowed comments on certain stories. They would pick and choose using their news judgment to say, this, is stor- this story is worth having a discussion, and this one is not. Um, and I like that idea where Journalistic, we can decide, like, you know, if it's, I don't know if you remember when we were at The Current, every time there was a story about crime in Hartford, 
<laughs> yeah. The comments would just be a nightmare of racist, horrible things mm-hmm. that were unnecessary, and that conversation wasn't necessary. Maybe we needed to have a separate conversation about sort of the larger issue, but not about that one incident. So turn off uh, comments on, on cop briefs is a way to yes. cut down <laughs> you know, on that. Yeah. I don't think that you need to have comments on cop briefs, but maybe you need to have it on an op-ed or uh, a column or you know, a really, uh, you know, a really controversial type of story but that actually has sides to it. Um, and if you limit the number of conversations that you're having, you know, to ones that are actually worthwhile and meaningful, then could you, Eugene or Ethan, because you have this small news, like you can get in there and actually moderate that. So you can help to not so much steer the conversation, but help people to, to listen to each other and, and talk back and forth and stay on point. Um, you also, because you have a smaller community, and in the last chapter of the book, there was this theory that I stumbled across, actually on a blog, that talked about the difference between a, uh, an online plaza and a warren. So a plaza, talking about, think about like a giant open space. And that's what our, our conversation spaces have generally been like. I feel like Facebook is a giant plaza, really. Um, or, you know, you go on the Washington Post, it's a huge plaza, so everyone's participating. But if you think of like a warren, and you know, that's what rabbits do, they burrow, and they have to work together. So mm-hmm. a warren is smaller, and there's been news organizations that have been sort of practicing and trying oh. out, seeing what it would be like to just have like a Slack group about one topic. PBS NewsHour did one during the election where they invited people to join this closed Facebook group, and it was a limited amount of people, and they tried to get different kinds of people. So then you have you know, representative people representing a whole bunch of different perspectives, but the conversation is smaller. You know, you can't, you couldn't have a debate if 200 people were on stage, right? Yes. That's, yeah, I've seen the Washington Post do that too with some of their political stuff. There's, uh, I'm a member of whatever Facebook group, and I guess that's what, oh, I didn't even realize that's what they were trying to do. Yeah, so it's by actually limiting the, the, it's not so much limiting the number of participants, because, you know, we want to do that necessarily where you know it's democracy everyone should have their free speech but if you're not going to contribute something meaningful then why are you there so you know just like anything else can you can you get to the people who really have something worthwhile to say and include them and then report on those conversations like you can draw it back out to the larger plaza by doing some reporting on all right so we had this debate and then you're going to report on what the people said right so if you had a town hall you would do the same thing you would report on what people said at the town hall not everyone can participate in the town hall like there's a limited amount of space there's a limited amount of time it's the same with you know online discourse is that when it's unlimited you know it's the endless argument Hmm. Like, I don't think anything valuable can come out of that. You just get exhausted. <laughs> what about... I'm exhausted. And I know, yeah. I know <laughs> you might mention this in the book, too. Maybe you mentioned it. Uh, you were reading YouTube comments, I think, during the whole presidential campaign, 2016. Oh. Yeah, and, during during the conventions, I was watching them on YouTube and reading the live stream of comments at the same time. My feeling is, because now I have uh, my son turn seven, as of this recording, he'll turn seven tomorrow. Uh, he watches a lot of YouTube. He's into like, Minecraft and all these YouTubers. And then when he starts clicking around, it's really easy to fall into. I, I just never realized how awful the comments are are on YouTube because I guess I use it the yeah. old-fashioned way. YouTube is a place where I put my videos and then embed them on the websites where I want them to be seen. But there's right. I've been exposed. There's an entire you know the the, the new network, uh, you know, in terms of uh, CBS and NBC. All, the kids are all on YouTube. Are they sort of the chief offenders? Is that where the is that where the cesspool has gone? Well, YouTube has notoriously had really horrible comment streams. Hmm. Um, and, you know, YouTube is owned by Google, um, and they've tried to, you know, add different things. So if you, you know, you should have your channel, and you should have the ability to either turn on or turn off comments. Um, and obviously you can moderate them if you want. But it is, they're notorious because they, you know, they're anonymous again, and they just, people just say the worst things. Um, and, you know, if I'm going to let my kid use YouTube, I use the, you know, the kid version yes. because then there's no comments. Yeah, and, it will, and, and I should note for anyone uh, watching this podcast, we do post it to YouTube and we turn off comments. <laughs> <laughs> what about... Uh, well, I think if you can't, if you're, if you're unable to moderate the discussion, then yeah. why have a discussion? Right? Then why host a discussion? That, and that's, like if I, re- if, if I read a story on, on you know, Valley Indy and it riles me up, 
and you, you're not having a discussion. I can post it on my own Facebook page and, and host my own discussion. That's and true. You don't have to be involved. You don't even I, have to know about it. I always remind we, you know, it's election season, and so we've quote banned unquote a few people from our Facebook page. Uh, and they always, well, I, they, first of all, they always claim they took a screenshot of the, like, well, all right, go take your screenshot to the Facebook police. But it, they, they say that, oh, we're limiting their, you know, their First Amendment rights, but I'm not suppressing what you go, there's a whole internet to post your comment on. We're just not allowing it uh, to be on our business page, essentially. Uh, That's right. The, the other thing it's I want to step. Right, yeah. We should be able to control that to some extent. You don't conclude in this in, in in your research or in the book that okay, getting rid of comments is a good thing. You say the opposite. No, I don't think getting rid of comments is a good thing at all because again, this is we have to move forward. And if if no one is going to champion these good conversations, then I think journalists should step up. I think it's a it's a good thing for us to do. And I've been thinking a lot about how even me as a as a professor here at UConn, how can I teach my students to, to ho host good conversations or to, to be a good debate moderator? Um, like, I want to come to your debate, Eugene, and see how you do it. <laughs> like, is there, are there certain skills that I can teach people um, to deal with other people? And I've been thinking about, you know, host, like ha forcing my students to host a debate or, and also taking, taking comments from, from online at the same time, which is what you see happen. Um, how can, like, is there other type of mediators and judges who I can interview and ask them, like, what do you do when you, you're having a heated exchange? How do, you, how do you calm that down? How do you get people to listen? You know, there's like counselors and, and people like that. I've been thinking about how can I translate that over into journalism so we can get better at hosting good conversations. Hey, so what's yeah. next for you now, Professor Shanahan? <laughs> uh, you, it must be, it's got to be a relief to have this, this book out there. I mean, it's 132 pages of research. Uh, <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to take a little break from reading too many comments uh, I, for a little while. Um, I felt like after the election I had like PTSD a little bit. Because yeah. They were so horrible. Um, but I am interested in figuring out, you know, the, that topic that I mentioned before is like, how can I teach my students to be brave, you know, conversation leaders, to be brave conversation moderators, and in the space where people are having conversations, whether it's on Facebook or some new technology that's coming out. I don't know if you wanted to check in, into it too, uh, Eugene, is that there's some open source commenting software that's being developed by the Mozilla Foundation by a, a project called the Coral Project. Hmm. Um, I, don't, I don't know if you've heard of them. They, I mentioned them right at the end of the book. But they are, have developed this new system that you can use for free. Um, it has all kinds of different tools. Um, and they have been working with the Washington Post and with other people at the New York Times to put this thing together. And they've been working on it for a few years now. And they've just started releasing some of their products, which are meant for the, the Washington Post is using it for their comments now, but it's also meant for smaller news organizations that can't, you know, that can't afford to hire technologists hmm. to figure this out. Oh, um, no so kidding. Yeah, I had no idea. You might want to try. I'll get right on it. You hear that, Paul Bass? <laughs> <laughs> so check All it right. out, the Coral Project. All right, Marie. That's it. Huh? That wasn't so bad, other than me blabbing at the beginning there. No, I appreciate you blabbing. And so where can people get the book? We'll end it with that. It's, um, it's available online. Um, you can find it on Amazon and on uh, Google, Google Books if you look for it. The publisher is Routledge, which is an academic publisher. I'll cut all this part out. Now it's just us awkwardly ending the conversation. <laughs> all right, now I'm going to hang up. Take care, Marie. Thank you. Okay, bye, Eugene. Bye. For hundreds of years, we brought you the news. Gave you the clues. Owners' profits were always sky high. Change in market now threatens our lives. Post literation, critical reading, dumbed down nation, signs of inbreeding. TV sucking ideas from our head. Public discourse just about dead. We'll ride the dinosaur. Yeah, right, the dinosaur Our readers are in the opens each day Online clickbait, a brilliant way It's free information, here to stay Not even hookers give it away Advertising Metastasizing Newsroom shrinking Constant attrition
Dinosaur. 